good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Some video conferencing and some by phone. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, uh, the Indiana Voice for Peace, Justice, Human Rights, and Intercultural Encounter, based here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Thank you to our board chair, Terry Doherty. We're recording the interview and we'll make it available on our website, Facebook page, and to those on our email listserv. We know that Bethlehem is the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic in the West Bank, and the refugee camps have been hit particularly hard. Uh, so it's important uh, to reach out to our friends there and we're delighted to spend some time today with our dear friend, uh, Dr. Abdel Fattah Abusror, founder and general director of the Arawad Cultural and Art Society in the Ida refugee camp in Bethlehem. One last piece of information that I'll be repeating at the end of the interview. Uh, if you'd like to make a tax deductible contribution to support Abed and the work of Arawad, you can, it's one of two ways, you can send a check to Indiana Center for Middle East Peace and mark it for Arawad. And we'll make sure that every penny that is sent to us will get to them. Our address, and I'll be repeating it at the end, is ICMEP, Post Office Box 12005, Fort Wayne, Indiana, 46862. The other way uh, would be to go to our website, Indiana CMEP, and follow the link there. Okay, now, so uh, uh, Abed, it's very good to see you. Uh, very good to see you. How, how, first of all, before we get into the work of our one and all the rest, uh, how are you and your wife and kids doing? Uh, good evening for everybody. Thank you for organizing this. Uh, Terry and Michael. We are doing well. Uh, Alhamdulillah, everybody is fine. And we hope that all of you are safe and healthy. And our hearts go to all the families who have been touched with this pandemic and uh, lost or suffer from the, the suffering of their beloved ones. So we pray for health and safety for everybody. And we hope that we will pass this stronger uh, together. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Abed. Uh, you're, you're living under, a, a, you might choose different language, but it strikes me un, under a, a double occupation curfew. One because of the coronavirus and one because of the Israeli occupation, the military occupation. I know you're in regular contact with your staff in Bethlehem on a daily basis, particularly uh, the Ida camp. Tell us about uh, um, the Ida camp and life there, and maybe the Haitia and the other camps, as you know about them in the West Bank, because we know that the situation for refugees might even be a little bit more difficult than in the general population. Well, uh, yes, Ida camp is one of the three refugee camps in Bethlehem uh, governorate, one of the 19 in the West Bank, and one of the 27 in Palestine, and one of the 59 in uh, including other refugee camps in neighboring countries. Uh, so we have about 6,200 people living in Ida refugee camp with a population of around 600, 630 families. Uh, with young population, uh, two-thirds are under 24 years old. And it is in a particular situation since we are surrounded by this illegal war of expansion and annexation on the east and north with some of the most frequent incursions by the Israeli occupation army. And of course, the population in refugee camps is touched by more than 50 to 60% of unemployment rate. So this is another burden uh, on the population. And uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, because it was, uh, the beginnings were in Bethlehem, in a hotel that hosted uh, a Greek uh, delegation and uh, then it start expanding a little bit also with the pandemic uh, on the Israeli side, 
with workers uh, coming back from the Israeli side uh, to the Palestinian uh, territories uh, and areas without being uh, really checked for the uh, for the disease and sent and even I don't know if you have seen today videos of Israeli soldiers cutting their own fence to allow smuggling the soldier, the workers who might be infected or not to the Palestinian areas without being controlled and so on. So expanding and the expansion of, of the infection in Palestinian areas, which has been strong in controlling, uh, in fact, the pandemic. Uh, we reached about 263 cases of uh, infected people in, in uh, the West Bank and Gaza. There is uh, 44 who have recovered from the disease, one death, and the others are still uh, under, uh, I mean, there is more than 35,000 people who are under quarantine, whether it's in their own houses or those who are infected in the official uh, quarantine area. In the refugee camps are hit particularly in, in the sense that it is uh, on one side a double closure, especially in Bethlehem area where it has started since we are in quarantine since now 35 days. And the Palestinian Authority has declared an additional month till the 6th of May to expand the uh, closure and limitation of movement for the population. And uh, with people are suffering from different shortages, then it was obvious that there is this hit of uh, food, medicine, for especially for chronically ill people, and so on. And to those who are daily workers as well um, add another tragedy to their own uh, life uh, suffering. Uh, the Israeli incursions did not stop, unfortunately, in certain areas. Even in some areas in the south of Bethlehem, uh, settlers and colonizers have been made conquests to the Palestinian villages and lands, poisoning uh, the earth and cutting trees and so on. And so it's ongoing, unfortunately. And the biggest danger, uh, actually, which is under discussion, is Israeli uh, government uh, discussing also the annexation of the West Bank. Yeah. And so they exploit this uh, situation also for their political purposes on one side to uh, discuss this annexation to follow up on the, on the deal of the century uh, designed by the government of Mr. Trump. And on the other side, they exploit Palestinian workers to work on them and retain them uh, or some of them for the building and so on, without giving them adequate protection. And then they throw them uh, in illegal ways on the Palestinian side without again being tested and so on. So all of this adds to the burden of the Palestinian Authority who tried to control by all means. And I guess uh, it was one of the most effective uh, control ways on one side to limit the expansion of the pandemic because otherwise we would be struggling hard with the limited resources that we have on our hospitals, ventilators. There is only four uh, ventilators in Bethlehem area, respiratory devices. Uh, on all the West Bank and Gaza, it's about 129 uh, devices. So it will never, even if all these people who are actually sick need the uh, devices, it would not be enough. Uh, uh, on the uh, other level, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, on the other level, uh, I guess the biggest challenge was also with the control on the medical equipment or swab tests that arrives to the Palestinian areas by the Israelis. And so, uh, especially in Gaza, for example, nothing was allowed in Gaza, and they have to try to uh, create ways to uh, manufacture their own uh, safety response uh, things, and even some design of a respiratory device as well. Uh, they made some prototypes in Gaza 
in Jerusalem University and in Hebron area with uh, Royal uh, co Company and so on. So that is a, a bigger challenge as well because Israelis are control, controlling what comes in and what goes out from uh, Palestinian areas. I wanted to, well, <clears throat> you, said, you said a mouthful and you gave us a real good overview. Uh, I want to pick. I want to pick out some of the things that you said, so you can highlight them a, a little bit more one at a time, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, um, you talked about. You talked about, uh, and and I've read this and heard this from other friends in the West Bank, that really the Palestinian Authority had a very effect. I mean, their strategy for controlling the pandemic has been one of the most successful in the world. I mean, it's been. Yes. I don't mean to underplay the, the crisis, but, but in comparison to the rest of the world, the percentages of people who have been uh, affected by the coronavirus have been rather small in the West Bank because people have been uh, stay, sheltering in place and, they, and the PA has had an effective strategy. Part of the problem has been, and this is the, one of the points I, I wanted you to, to talk a little bit more about, if a worker, if a Palestinian worker who has to go to Israel to, for his, his or her employment, if they get sick there, because the Israelis haven't had such an effective strategy, if they get sick in Israel, the Israelis bring them straight to one of the checkpoints and dump them on the other side as quickly as possible, and they have to fend for themselves. And so you, you, mentioned, you mentioned that briefly about uh, soldiers at the fences or settlers at the fences. Say a little bit more about, about that and how that's then inflicting itself in the West Bank. Yes, I guess there, there has been a lot of critics to the Israeli government for their late response and the way they are handling the pandemic. Uh, now they have more than 9,900, and I guess the, the exact number until now is 9,968 infected cases with about uh, 80 deaths and uh, tens of thousands of, of people under quarantine and so on. Uh, so the deal was with the Palestinian Authority that if they want to keep the workers, that they have to provide them with the protection and shelter for a period of one or two months at least, because they wanted to keep them for the, during the Passover so that the construction continues and uh, other work continues. Yeah. And so unfortunately, the Palestinian Authority after that agreement was surprised that the Israelis did not respect that deal and Palestinian workers who seem to be infected or show some uh, symptoms, I guess even they were not even uh, tested. They were just uh, thrown away uh, on, on these places. And when the Palestinian Authority tried to put these limitations of when, where to deliver and, uh, these workers and to handle them, they started creating these alternative ways to allow them to pass it through the, uh, how you call it, the defense they cut in, or even the water or sewage passage areas, uh, like tunnels under the bridges and so on, to allow the workers to pass it through. Uh, so they did not respect that. They did not respect their engagement to protect these workers and to help them be safe. And they respect, did not respect the engagement that they had with the Palestinian Authority to deliver these workers on specific areas so that the Palestinian medical teams can meet them and do at least the primary checking before sending them for home quarantine or take them to the official quarantine areas to be hospitalized and so on, unfortunately. Yeah, thanks for flushing that out a little bit more. You also mentioned and of course, uh, uh, this has gone unnoticed by the international community. Uh, all the while, the quarantining and the sheltering in place uh, uh, is happening both in Israel and especially in the West Bank, rather successfully in the West Bank. Uh, um, 
there's still military incursions into the West Bank. Homes are still being demolished. Night raids are still continuing to arrest kids and young men. Uh, illegal uh, settlers are uh, uprooting olive trees, creating new illegal posts in the Jordan Valley. And as you said, there's even talk and maybe even action toward annexing, annexing parts are all of the West Bank. Uh, can you say more about uh, just, can you, are there examples or can you say more about that to give us more details? Well, the examples of the illegal settlers actions are mostly in, in the south of Bethlehem area and in uh, the neighborhoods of Ramallah and Nablus areas where they attacked villages, they uh, cut trees, they poisoned the fields uh, and so on. Uh, they did not start annexation except with the Jordan Valley that has been started and they kept control over that uh, as well. But there has been a reaction from the Palestinian Authority uh, rejecting that and trying to put naked the Israeli policies about it and, and so on. So until today, it is within the discussion, the Israeli uh, Knesset and government discussions uh, about it as far as I know. And no action was really made to uh, on the ground except with the Jordan Valley uh, and so on. But the idea is that they exploit every chance where the attention of the world is somewhere to go elsewhere. That's, that reminds me of the incursion and invasion of 2002 for 43 days, besieging the Church of the Nativity, uh, invading all the West Bank and so on. They started building this illegal wall of expansion and annexation. And they put the foundation on uh, uh, of it in, in, as barbed wires, three meters high, three meters deep in the ground, to then erect it with uh, six meters to 12 meters high, depending on, on, on the location and so on. So they always use these strategies when there is such tragic situations to uh, change the orientation. Uh, the media is looking somewhere and their actions is going elsewhere. They have not been very successful in dealing with the pandemic until now, despite all the measures they are trying late to do, actually. But even with their curfew, even with their uh, thing, it, it is within the limited time frame. But the construction continues, the Israeli policies continues, the invasions continues, uh, killing innocent people continues, imprisonment of young people. They invaded the Haitian refugee camp a few times <laughs> during this pandemic. They arrested some young people and so on. They shot uh, and killed some, uh, another young man and so on. So it's unfortunately still going on and they are talking about protection, protecting of people and limiting the expansion of the pandemic while they are one of the main causes of it, especially in what concerns us yeah. as well. <clears throat> one of the things, thank you for that. One of the things that we've been really concerned about here in the U.S., um, uh, a, a number of uh, uh, activist groups around the country have been focused on, uh, through Defense for Children International Palestine, have been focused on pr the prison population, especially the children and young people in prisons and about how they become incubators then for, for the virus because they're in such close proximity. Uh, is, there any, is there any movement within the Israeli government to loosen that or, uh, or not? Uh, talk to us about the, the prison situation. Unfortunately, we did not hear about it. In fact, one of, uh, one of the prisoners who was released was infected by the virus and again the palestinian authority was not informed about it and so imagine when when the families meet their released ones and you know how much love and how many people are meeting and so in engineering it was ten thousand people more than ten thousand people to receive one of the liberated prisoners from the israeli uh, presidents wow. but 
fortunately, uh, recently, some people who have ended their time and were released, they did uh, uh, make their precautions and told their families to stay away and did their own home quarantine, uh, so on to protect their uh, their beloved ones as well. So unfortunately, the Israelis have been, I don't know how the disease got to the, uh, the prisoners, the Palestinian prisoners who are <laughs> under the most secure conditions. Sure. And I don't know if it is in purpose or not that it has happened by one of the guards or whatever. But it did happen, and there were some cases of infected people within Israeli prisons. And there has been a lot of calls, even from the uh, Palestinian president and the Palestinian government, to liberate those who are sick and who are chronically sick and who have their immunity system compromised and so on to be released so that we can take care of them. Until today, there has been no response concerning that, uh, these requests. <clears throat> I've been trying to make some connections with folks in Gaza to have an interview there. I'm still working on that. Tell, tell us what you know about Gaza. Well, Gaza, as you know, is completely besieged. So the only cases uh, which rise to 11 cases, as far as I know, and among whom I guess there is uh, only four that had remained uh, infected and did not recover, uh, is already a prison that is besieged from all areas. And despite the interdiction of Israelis to allow medical equipment and so on to reach Gaza, they have done well until now. Uh, of course, let alone the, the burden of the daily life and the some even time shelling of uh, Palestinian areas in Gaza by the Israeli military and so on. Uh, but there has been, I, I think, good measures on that level. However, the quarantine area is deplorable and inhuman on in one way or the other because there is no, I don't know if there is no other possibilities or there was lack of vision about it and so on. But uh, there has been hard quarantine area for the families in a school with lack of decent uh, sanitary situation uh, for them. Uh, there has been kind of coordination between part of the government in Gaza and part of the government in the West Bank to coordinate the efforts of the Palestinian Minister of Health. However, everything should pass by the Israeli permissions and so on. So that makes uh, a lot of challenge for the Palestinian Ministry of Health uh, to coordinate working or coordination of materials and, and health uh, products and so on to pass from one side to the other, unfortunately. Uh, but I think we have been extremely lucky with the context in Gaza that we have this limited number. And uh, these people, in fact, who carried the disease were outside the country and came back from uh, two students who started that, I guess, and got it to some of the Palestinian security officers on, on the passage in Gaza and so on. And uh, those carried it to others. But uh, and Alhamdulillah, it is within, it's very limited. And now there is only four cases who are still infected, uh, did not recover, and seven uh, among the 11 were, uh, have recovered. Well, that's, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know that. That's new, that's new news to me um, because uh, the scare, of course, is because they're living in such close quarters in Gaza that it would just spread like wildfire, you know? And uh, so this is good news. This is good news that you're sharing with me. Yes, because I guess, as I said, the Palestinian Authority have really been very serious about the situation and took the measures immediately and followed the example of Korea, I think, uh, of South Korea with that. Uh, so they, the expansion of the disease have been extremely limited. And uh, uh, it's only for those careless, by careless people who really did not make attention uh, and some of the workers who came back and did not respect the recommendations of the Minister of Health and so on. Otherwise, the people have been very restrained and uh, I mean, we are used to that. So that 
put us on equality now with everybody in the world. And I guess especially with the Israelis who now know what it means to put people under curfew, what it means to be under curfews, what yeah. it means to dehumanize people and so on. And I remember one of uh, the Palestinian journalists who have Israeli journalists contacting him and asked him, how could you live under such situation? How were we Israelis able to, go, to make you suffer in such way, in such an inhuman way? And oh, so wow. On. So it is, it is a clear lesson for everybody who do not understand what it means to restrain people and put them under curfews and not allow them to circulate and not allow them the basic human rights of free movement and, and so on. Because we have uh, a few folks uh, who have joined us on this call, I'm going to ask two more. I have a number of questions yet, but I'm going to ask two more. And then uh, I'm going to invite, I see Linda and Anita and Pam and Rami and George. Uh, so I'm giving you a heads up. If you, if we'll, we'll have time for a couple of questions from you all, if you'd like to, uh, to ask Abed a question in just a couple of minutes. So let me ask him a couple more. And then if you'd like to ask a question, you can jump in then, okay? So Abed, uh, um, <clears throat> You're in Jerusalem right now in your apartment there with your family. Um, we know that your wife is a school principal in the old city. Um, uh, how, are things in, how are things in Jerusalem and how are things in the old city? Yeah, she is a vice principal, in fact, deputy principal. Okay. Uh, well, uh, that was the situation. When I arrived to, to, to Jerusalem, the Palestinian Authority have declared uh, the day after, uh, or the, the same day, in fact, that Bethlehem was under full closure. And the Israelis also announced that. So I was uh, on one side retained in, in Jerusalem. And the kids and my wife continued to go to their schools until the 15th or 16th, when the Israelis started uh, making measures for those who came from Bethlehem should be under a home quarantine and so on, which we did, of course, um, and so on. Uh, lately, the, the Israeli uh, police and Minister of Health issued uh, some recommendations and they try to force them in some areas, like uh, people should not be circulating uh, except within the limit of 100 meters around their homes uh, to buy uh, products, uh, goods or whatever. And uh, they also later on said people should be moving with uh, gloves and masks. Uh, and otherwise they will have a fine of 500 shekels and so on. Uh, the same situation they try to follow with the closures of mosques and churches and so on. They have a lot of trouble with the Israeli uh, religious Jews uh, who have been not very respectful for that and they have to deal with them in sometimes in a very violent way to uh, uh, how do you, do you say to separate them and, and so on and confine them but the globally i think uh, there has been uh, I, I guess they waited for their feast to end uh, and so on and then the easter so they started a curfew that they said since Tuesday to Friday to tomorrow. And then I don't know how the situation would be. So it's a little bit loose in, in that sense because some people, when they hear the Israeli police circulating around, they would hide or whatever. But not much uh, part of the huge expansion, about 10,000 people now, a little bit less, are infected by the virus on the Israeli side. Part of it is not respecting the recommendations uh, that have been given uh, by the Ministry of Health. And sometimes also what disturbs that is the military actions. The military actions are not co uh, coordinated with the Ministry of Health uh, recommendations. Uh, so that makes a huge problem on, on that <laughs> side. Uh, we have been very respectful to the quarantine and we have been uh, in the house and almost during these this period of almost 32 days, 33 days now, I have got 
used to buy vegetables and fruits and so on only four times uh, and so on. So we try to, to, to be uh, respectful to help each other and protect each other and the others. Even my parents-in-law live like 400, 500 meters. We just Skype or talk on the phone and, and don't visit. Uh, my mother-in-law uh, is sick, so we don't want to expose her as well to any other burden uh, on one sure. side or in one way or the other. Uh, and of course, I follow up with my team, so we can talk about that uh, also. Yeah, I want to. I want to ask you about Arawad in just a second. I mean, that's really what I want to ask you about. But I have one more, one more uh, uh, question about just the situation. You know, uh, with banks closed, um, I'm just wondering. Uh, um, I, I'm assuming that if people are going to the market or other kind of the necessary kinds of shopping that they have to do, are stores just giving credit? Uh, are, how are neighbors helping neighbors? I mean, uh, uh, the economy, just like here in the U.S. Uh, and around the world, the economy must be suffering greatly. And uh, um, uh, particularly uh, uh, in, in these little neighborhood shops uh, where vegetables and meat are sold, uh, these small shops, I'm assuming that uh, people sometimes don't have the money to pay for what they need. Within the West Bank, yes. Uh, I can assure that there is a lot of people who buy on credit uh, from uh, the shops within Ida camp and within the small uh, quarters or, and neighborhoods, not from big supermarkets or whatever, or companies. Uh, there has been some beautiful initiatives from some people who put vegetables and fruits for open and put a label that take what you need and if you cannot afford to pay it, don't pay it. Uh, and if you want to pay it, then later you can write, but if you cannot, then it's fine. And uh, I also uh, have seen an example of a bush uh, meat uh, shop, chicken and, uh, and meat, and also they put on an area, uh, take what you need, and if you cannot pay, then it's donated for you, and so on. Uh, there has been other initiatives with people sending uh, packages of food, and so on. And this is where we were trying to help the most uh, with our community, and so on, to try to provide food. And a uh, bigger issue is with the medicine uh, as well. But uh, in terms of, of these kinds of things, yes. And there has been also some initiatives where people who have some money go to the market, to some shops, like in Aida camp and some neighborhoods, and said, give me your book of debts. So if people uh, tell me which families are the most, uh, the poorest in one way. And then they pay without telling everybody that they have paid for them. And that just the shopkeeper erases the debt or what the, these guys have paid for and diminish the, the debt they had and so on. So there has been beautiful, uh, really solidarity actions from local community or from organizations that try to raise funds to help their own community and so on. And... I guess, uh, يعني, alhamdulillah, nobody is dying from hunger uh, in, in Palestine. And uh, we have a lot of meals that don't need uh, very expensive ingredients as well. Uh, so that has been a, a very beautiful spirit. But of course, the shortage is enormous. And of course, uh, the banks are close to individuals. So they, if you don't have a credit card or whatever, then it's very challenging to, to be able to buy anything or deal with anything and so on. Uh, and that's why the burden is enormous for emergency uh, response teams in the camps and elsewhere. Now I, I wanna, uh, and then we're gonna turn it over and if any of the other folks who are listening in wanna ask a question, but I wanna ask you now about Arawad, you know, uh, um, your commitment to the arts and to the fostering of a positive culture 
has been yeah. enormous. And so the art, the arts, you're an arts centric organization. That's been the, that's been the primary, in fact, the only emphasis for since your founding. However, just knowing you and and, and being around Arawat, it's also very much uh, uh, needs based and community based. And so, whenever there's been a need in the community, Arawat has been one of those organizations that's stepped up to just meet the need of the meet the needs of the people, whatever they might be. And so I guess what I want to ask you to share with us a little bit is tell us about the work of our now uh, uh, and, and uh, how you're stepping in, in in this time of pandemic to meet the needs of the community. Well, I guess when this I started, your, this, is time, this is your time for a commercial. <laughs> You know, when I started Arawad in 1998 with a group of friends, the basic concept was, uh, for me, I wanted to do theater for children and young people. And I started with this concept that I call beautiful resistance, recognizing that every resistance against injustice, oppression, occupation is a beautiful act of humanity. And choosing arts, culture, and education are great acts of resistance. The aim essentially was how to save lives, how to inspire hope, how to give our children and young people to, to express themselves in the most beautiful, creative, and also non-armed ways, and think living rather than dying for Palestine. But ours are not uh, an ivory tower. Uh, ours are not uh, far from people, and they are there to serve humanity and help people keep their dignity and not to transform them into charity actions or beggars at the end of the day. So that's why we cannot be saying we are doing arts for arts and we forgot about the, what is around us. So when the second Intifada started in 2000, I could not say, well, I am just doing my theater and forget about everything else. It was about building peace within individuals to be able to build it in their community, in their country and beyond and in the world. So how can we build peace within individuals if these individuals do not have a way to express themselves one way or the other? So that's why others expanded in dance, in photography, in video, in education, supportive education programs for children who have difficulties in learning, working with kindergartens, with the schools, with parents, focusing a lot also on mothers, because I believe it's women who change the world much more than the man, and who will build the peace within the house through the mother and so on to build it in the community. And expanding beyond that to go all over the world, doing our shows, performing our shows, and show this other image of Palestine that is not usually shown in the media, say that we are human beings, we reclaim and we defend our humanity. And we are not born with genes of hatred or violence. Nobody is born with that. But we are people who are under illegal occupation. And we have every legitimate right to resist the occupation by all means. And yet, most of the people have resistance through non-armed ways, through keeping their culture, their humanity, their dignity. And when people come, the most thing they feel, how much warmth and generosity and Palestinians have and how hospitable they are despite the inhuman conditions that they are put through by this illegal Israeli occupation and by the marginalization even of the international community. Luckily, people like you who bring people and see and meet directly with, with people like us, see that whatever the media is transmitting, there is a shortage of truth about what is it transmitted about Palestine and Palestinian people and the facts on the ground created by this Israeli illegal occupation. So uh, that's why I guess when there was the siege of the nativity and the siege of Bethlehem in 2002 for 43 days, we were working 24 hours a day. There is no clinic in Aida refugee camp. Arwad also transformed into an emergency medical clinic, working 24 hours a day, a school for supportive education program because the schools also were closed during curfews. And Aida camp have suffered a lot of curfews and incursions by the Israeli occupation sure. army. So we have to deal with a lot of emergency responses 
on our own because even the Palestinian Authority could not intervene at a certain time. We are not part of the municipalities, though in this crisis specifically, the mayor of Bethlehem has been very cooperative and have been wonderful in dealing with, with, with the situation and help us to with uh, sanitation materials and so on. And his, uh, the employees worker also do spraying of uh, disinfectants and so on around. Uh, so we have to deal with things on our own. Onorwa has not been intervening when there is danger for their staff. And this is what we see today with the relief work is completely absent through UNRWA and so yeah. on. Though the, uh, the director of the camp, UNRWA director of the camp and so on with his staff have been amazing also. And the sanitation team has been amazing in doing the work uh, on, on that level. But relief and social work and so on has been ex extremely paralyzed by UNRWA and no help has arrived to the, the camps through UNRWA and so on. So there is a lot of things that we have to deal with on our own. And as a, a, a community-based center, as a center within the heart of the Aida refugee camp, we also, even with the help we try to provide and organizing teams with other associations in the camp, with the popular committee in the camp, an emergency response team that has been used kind of to emergency responses during the invasions and incursions and curfews. So it was easy, uh, let's say for us, <laughs> to coordinate things on one way or the other, trying to raise funds, trying to link with Palestinian pharmaceutical companies, trying to deal with people who could help locally or internationally to be able to support uh, our own families to keep their dignity one way or the other. So the biggest challenge that we are facing today is on medical level, because there are medicines uh, for uh, chronically ill people, and some are available within the Palestinian Authority dispensaries, and some are available within the UNRWA clinics. Um, but, to, uh, but there are many others which are not available, especially for children and young people. And especially, for example, diabetes, depends for uh, insulin. That is not available and that are very expensive and uh, locally. And even for testing the diabetes, these uh, strips uh, almost also are in great shortage and so on. So there is uh, some needs. There are some cases of uh, transplantation of uh, uh, spine marrow, uh, bone marrow, and, and so on as well, and cancer cases, and so on. So there are some who need, <laughs> like even the Palestinian Authority can provide for, for, for their needs, and so on. So this is the case uh, that creates a problem a little bit. And of course, babies and uh, pregnant women with the vaccinations, with the uh, milk needs and so on, and uh, sure. additional products that are needed for them and so on. Uh, fortunately, uh, during this month, we were able with the help and donations we, we received to um, be able to cover part of it. But we have another month to go <laughs> as well. And so the, the and Ramadan is coming also the fasting month on the 23rd yeah. of April and so on. Yeah, really so cool. a lot of challenges are coming as well uh, and so on. But you know, uh, the Palestinian way is the food for one equal, is good for two, and the for two is good for four and so on. So if money comes, we expand. If money don't, we may shrink a little bit. But the work continues, and we have an amazing team who are try to respond not only within the refugee camp, but also also within the neighborhoods yeah. and uh, neighboring areas. And um, a few days ago, we have a meeting with the uh, mayor of Bethlehem who came and we did visit also the Franciscan sisters uh, convent nearby. And uh, the message was clear, you are part of Ida camp. So whatever thing we can help with, we will help with. 
and whatever we can't, we will contact the mayor of Pesach to help uh, as well. So it's, Very good. it's a, a spirit of community that is there to help each body, each one within the camp and around the camp and help our people keep their dignity and pass this challenge together and so on. So I guess we won the battle. We did not win the war against the corona, <laughs> but we are winning the battle up till today. And inshallah, we will pass it all over the world together because uh, the government responses in, in different countries have been various. But the amazing thing is that the richest, biggest countries in the world have really been the worst to respond well to, to this pandemic. And hopefully they will learn the lesson and put the human value in a precious uh, uh, level than their own businesses and, and the economy. Thank, thank you very much for that, Abed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause just for, uh, for a second uh, and ask if any of you who are on now with us would like to ask Abed a question. And if you do, remember, you have to unmute yourself uh, in order to ask the question. So most of the, those of you who I'm, I'm looking at here uh, uh, have been to uh, Arawad. Most of you have been to Arawad with me. George, I don't know if you've been to Arawad or not, but it's really good to see you, George. Um, so anyway, uh, is there anybody who would like to ask Abed a question? And you can unmute very easily by holding your space bar down if you have a keyboard, and then release the space bar to re return to mute. That was the voice of God coming uh, uh, out, of, out of the heavens. Any questions for Abed? Yes, uh, I have great appreciation for what you've been sharing with us. Uh, it is not easy from our vantage point in the U.S. to have clear indication of what this coronavirus means for other parts of the world. Uh, I have gotten a sense from some voices from Palestine that uh, suggests that the rest of us are able now to experience a little bit of the sheltering in place that has been a necessity of life there. Uh, you mentioned briefly uh, the limited number of ventilators available for health care for those that are in need of that. Uh, how is the medical staff and the medical system holding up at this point? You may have heard that in the U.S. It, the, the virus has taken a, a toll on health care workers because of the lack of uh, personal protection equipment, long hours, uh, the congested hospitals and so forth. And many of them have in fact contracted the virus and yeah. uh, more than a few have died from that. How, how is that holding up for you, both in the West Bank and in, in Gaza with their more limited uh, healthcare as I understand it? Thank you, George, excellent question, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I guess we are part of what is happening in the world in that uh, lack of, of resources. However, there is, was a lot of improvisation, protection materials, uh, one way or the other. And the other thing is, was depending on a quarantine, not in hospitals, but in the location where um, the infection started like the first cases were in a hotel in Beit Jala. And so uh, all those who were tested uh, were put in quarantine within the hotel. And there was two doctors with them during all the period of quarantine. And uh, everything was delivered directly to the space where they were. Uh, on the testing uh, level, we have a huge shortage of swabs and so on, and protection material as well, and so on. So a lot was distancing. Uh, I'm not in direct contact with the people who have been. There was little uh, con contact uh, with uh, infected people uh, directly, even with delivering food, even with delivering some of the medicine uh, to diminish the fever or whatever. Uh, but it's the same situation. That's why there was a huge restriction on movement and so on 
so that we take the precautions not to spread the disease, not to infect others, rather than to treat the people, uh, and so on. Otherwise, it would be completely catastrophic if those who were infected got to the hospitals and followed all the procedures uh, with all other uh, people who might also need these respiratory diseases uh, for their own uh, uh, respiratory devices because they are sick and need uh, artificial respiration and so on. But the, uh, again, following the rules of uh, WHO, following the Korean example of precautions and uh, prote um, protection measures and so on, uh, the limitation of the Palestinian Authority is enormous. And uh, even, uh, as I said, you look on the Israeli side who are more equipped and more so on have a huge expansion and some hospitals were shut. This happened only once in uh, Tul Karim, where a hospital was completely closed because uh, the person who came uh, and then tested positive, and then they have to quarantine all the medical team and, and, and so on in uh, Tul Karim, Thabit Ibn Thabit uh, uh, Hospital. But otherwise, there has been huge uh, precautions in dealing with that and isolating people either in their own houses or within two hotels in Bethlehem area where infections have been shown. And then for those who are really sick, they have been uh, put in a center for rehabilitation, again, allocated only for the corona cases and not the general hospitals uh, that are dealing with that. Thank you, Abed. We have time for another question. Well then, let me uh, let me start at least moving this toward a close. So we really appreciate your time, Abed. Uh, I'm interested. That, you know, uh, we're really concerned, of course, about the um, about the pandemic and what's happening now. Is there any word coming from uh, uh, the mayor of Bethlehem or the Ministry of Tourism from from uh, the PA about when the West Bank might be opened back up again for internationals to uh, to come for tourism to open up again? Well, I guess this is not in our hands on any level. It's the Israelis who will decide when they will open the borders or not. But uh, what is clear is that these two weeks will be a, a determining factors. If there is a new cases that appear within the West Bank and in Bethlehem area, then it will expand for another period of quarantine. If not, then hopefully we'll be in a safe area where people can move around. And uh, the issue of uh, circulation coming in or leaving the country is in with the hand of the neighboring countries, uh, including the Israeli uh, government or the Jordanian government who limit the borders uh, one way or the other. Uh, the situation in Jordan is, uh, less dangerous, let's say, than on the Israeli side, but uh, there are still cases that are coming. So hopefully within the context that we have actually, we have, uh, according to the Palestinian Authority, they put scenarios to start, if there is no cases appear, no new cases appear, to start going back to universities for the staff only, not the students. And um, some ministries uh, are starting the 23rd of April. And then if another week, if there is no cases, then start to allow students and so on to, to go and to arrive to the 6th of May for a general opening. But if there are new cases, then every new cases will extend this for 14 days at least and so on. Abed, you... Uh, um, um, this is my second to last question, so uh, we're wrapping up here. Um, you mentioned uh, Ramadan before. You know, yesterday was Passover for our Jewish friends. Uh, we're in the midst of Holy Week here in the in the West for uh, Christians. Ramadan is coming up in what about two weeks? Um, so it's a two-part question. First of all, 
will Ramadan positively or negatively impact the spread of the, the virus? And number two, as a practicing Muslim yourself, uh, how has your faith played a part in sustaining you and your family during these tough times? Well, I guess uh, faith is a huge uh, package of uh, comfort and help because uh, we believe that nothing will touch us if God didn't permit it to touch us and nothing will uh, be deprived from us if God did not decide to put us on test uh, to be deprived of it. Uh, and, you know, basic thing within Islam is also cleaning and property and so on. So this is also uh, when you feel that people are exaggerating, you say it's not enough. Uh, so I guess it's, uh, it's reinforcing. And uh, if we trust God, if we trust Allah, then nothing will stop us. That means you don't let away precaution because God will help you if you help yourself. <laughs> and so that's why it's important that you help yourself, you protect yourself, you protect others. So that will help you to be safe. <laughs> Otherwise, you cannot go around and circulate and say, God protect me, God protect me. God protects you and you protect yourself and protect the others. Concerning Ramadan, I guess it's because, uh, you know, unfortunately, for example, we miss the prayers in the mosque, we miss the prayers of Friday. And, uh, of course. Yeah. and so on so it's a huge uh, emptiness sometimes but you know there is necessity and you should respect these necessities and so on it's not like respecting the right of expression and denying that right of expression if it is against the government or, or whatever this is the only way that we don't respect the right of expression to free movement when you are sick or when you make a danger. So concerning Ramadan, I guess it might be challenging if there is a lot of cases. Uh, if cases, if people are infected, then, uh, and, and generally in Islam, if they are sick, they have the right not to do it and they can compensate for it after they are recovered. But the biggest challenge within this pandemic is that you should uh, drink a lot so that you don't have the throat dry and so on. So this is the biggest challenge. So there is a discussion with some uh, Palestinian uh, Muslim uh, uh, clerks, scientists or scholars or whatever uh, leaders that uh, in some areas they might allow people to not do if this represent a danger for their life. And if people are not infected and uh, keep their quarantine and so on, then there is no harm in doing that. I guess on personal level, we are doing actually the Monday and Thursday fasting. Um, uh, it's part of, some Muslims do that every uh, Monday and uh, Thursday. So we're doing that and we feel very good, uh, alhamdulillah. Yani. Uh, so uh, it would not affect us on personal level if we are healthy and, and do not interact with others and do not expose ourselves to, to, to possibilities of being infected. But if you are infected, if you are sick, then uh, you have every right not to do it and uh, keep yourself healthy and so on. So, Abed, let me, uh, let me close this by uh, asking you, uh, how can we support you? And is there a particular initiative uh, through Arawad uh, that our funds uh, might help support? So, I, I, know, I know money is just a part of how we can support you. So, talk about that, but also then talk about, is there a particular initiative that Arawad is participating in that we can financially support too? Well, uh, as, as you know, part of the emergency response is to help people keep their dignity with providing food and medicine to, to those who are in need. And after 35 days now, everybody is in need somehow. Uh, and as Ramadan is coming again, uh, at least 
uh, you should provide around 1,200 to 500, 1,500 packages of food to uh, every family, uh, to all the families. In fact, at least twice during this month uh, to be able to live decently. Uh, the other way is will be allocated to medical uh, help for uh, children, uh, for uh, chronically ill people, and for special cases of diseases that are not covered by the Palestinian Authority or by UNRWA medicine. The third thing is that, you know, uh, part of our WAD is trying to generate its own income uh, through the work we are doing and through the guest house that we have and so on. And so all the reservations uh, that have been made for March and April and May now have been canceled and so on. So that did uh, cost us a huge amount of money that could help us pay our salaries and so on. And uh, so part of it could help us <laughs> pay our uh, employees who are still working and so on and, and do part of this distribution and uh, response uh, to the emergency that we are living in. But you can choose whatever way you want to support and whatever uh, action uh, you want to support, uh, help us to do either of uh, if it is the uh, the emergency response for the population in the camp or part of the emergency response and part of the arwad needs or whatever it's free and the money will be allocated to that only thank you abed uh, um i want to just uh, close by reminding the folks who will who are seeing it now or will be watching this the recorded interview if you'd like to make a tax-deductible contribution to support the work of the ROWAD Center, you can send a tax-deductible check to Indiana Center for Middle East Peace and mark it for ROWAD. Uh, um, also, there's now a link on our website, indianacmep.org, and you'll find the link there and you can make the, uh, your tax-deductible contribution there. Uh, just make sure that it's marked for Arawad. Uh, we'll make sure that every penny that you send will get uh, to Abed and our friends in the Ida camp. Our address, for those of you who are going to mail a check, is ICMEP, Post Office Box 12005, Fort Wayne, Indiana, 46862. Thanks to Abid. Uh, thank you, uh, my friend, for joining us today. Warmest greetings to your wife and to your kids. We at the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace stand in solidarity with you, all the staff at Arawad, and all of our pa Palestinian friends, especially now, uh, in addition to the sting of the Israeli military occupation, the, the devastating impact of the coronavirus. Virus. We'll let all of you, our friends here who are watching this recorded interview, when our next interview with a change maker takes place. And again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Abed, do you have any closing words for us? Well, again, thank you all uh, for those who have seen and those who will see. And uh, our hearts are with everybody in this world, whether they like us or don't like us, but uh, we have so much love that we can share with everybody in the world that we hope that everybody will be healthy and safe, that all of you will meet your beloved ones uh, after this crisis is over, that uh, all the people in this world feel more compassionate, more understanding, and uh, more empathy to those who are suffering. And in this unique challenge that we face and put us on equal grounds on every level all over the world, regardless of our color or religion or ethnicity. We pray for all those who lost their beloved ones that God, God give them patience and strength to follow up and that all those who are isolated or separated be united and much love to everybody. Thank you, Michael and uh, 
your team for organizing this. Thank you, Terry, for coordinating and zooming and recording <laughs> all of this. And thanks for everybody who is supporting in whatever way possible uh, that we keep this humanity alive and that despite the Israeli uh, isolation for Palestinians and dehumanization, we defend this humanity well and we hope to welcome you all in Palestine one day free <laughs> of occupations and oppression. And meanwhile, you are most welcome as well to come until that day happens. Beautiful resistance is the word for the day. It is Thank indeed. Thank, Thank you, you so Abed. much. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks Abed. We will uh, see you soon, inshallah, in uh, Bethlehem. Inshallah. Be most welcome. Bye Thank now. You. God bless you all. Thank you.